So I try to live my life um, nowadays as a thank you because I'm very, very, very conscious that I didn't get to sit in this red circle today on my own volition or on my, on my own efforts. I had a, a really, really incredible support network around me, whether it was my family, whether it was my friends, whether it was the clinicians that helped me, whether it was a donor, you know, someone putting 50p into a charitable pot. So all these people that helped me, both known and unknown, thanked and unthanked, I owe them a great big debt. I owe them a massive, massive thank you that I'll never, ever be able to put into words and repay that debt. So I try to live my life as a thank you. I try to look in the mirror in the morning and say that today's going to be another day where I say thank you. So on the 1st of August in 2009 was, was actually arguably one of the best days of my life. Um, I married the woman of my dreams. Her name's Marissa and her mum's here, so I've got to say nice things about her. <laughs> um, you know, we'd been, we'd been dating for a while and, and, uh, and you know, it was our big day on, on, the, 1st of, on the 1st of August. And it, was, it rained that day, which is apparently lucky. Um, but it was a wonderful day, and I knew that I was marrying the person that um, I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. So less than three months later, um, I found myself in, in Afghanistan. And as with all these countries that I've been to over the years, it was a beautiful country. Um, I can see the beauty in, in, in many different things and, and the beauty in, in its people as well, and, and I always try to find something that's good and something that... Um, I believe is beautiful. Now, we were supposed to leave at about 4 a.m. under the cover of darkness. And when I say under the cover of darkness, in, Afga in Afghanistan, there's no ambient light. It is pitch black. So I've got my um, night vision goggles on, and uh, we sit there waiting. And our interpreter, or our interrupter, as we used to call them, he was late. God knows where he was. Um, he didn't really have an, a huge excuse because there's no Starbucks out there. There's no cost of coffee. The bus wasn't late. Um, I just think he just wanted an extra 20 minutes in his bed space. And uh, eventually he turned up and, and we left our patrol base. So I was in the middle of about 20 blokes in a long file. And our idea was that we were going to leave under the cover of darkness and we were going to patrol for about three or four kilometres which and every, you know, that could take a, an hour if you're in, in the UK, but for us it would take you know, a whole morning because we'd have to metal detect the whole route. And the guy that had the metal detector is called the Valen, so he's called the Valen Man. Um, we're very simple in the army. And his job is, is actually really difficult because he's doing a very unsoldierly like thing. He's walking on, and looking at the floor in front of him and swinging this metal detector. And his job is just to look at the floor. He's got a man behind him with a weapon just to protect him. And then the rest of the troops behind him. And it's his job to protect, protect us. So I don't really know how it happened, but um, I activated an improvised explosive device. And it took off my right leg instantly, and that ended up in a bush somewhere. I believe it's being used as a doorstop somewhere, so at least it's been put to good use. <laughs> my left leg was degloved from my ankle to my knee. Um, I damaged my arm. Um, so I've got some scar tissue there and I can't actually straighten it. But as with all these things, it's the perfect angle for swimming. <laughs> so there's a silver lining everywhere. Um, I also lost, rather inconveniently, my right testicle. Uh, and it was one of my favourite ones. <laughs> And this is why I should say to my mother-in-law, earmuffs, um, it got a medium amount of use, sorry. Um, so I could see all my injuries. I was unconscious for a split second. Um, and in my mind, it was like being in the Millennium Falcon, and I could see all these stars in front of me in, this, in my unconscious state in this split second, which lasted for an eternity. And there was a few questions that came up. Am I injured? If I am injured, is anybody else injured? And is if, if anybody else is injured, can I treat them? So these are questions that kind of appeared into my mind. And then I woke up with a bit of a, a start, and I realised that things had changed. I wasn't going to just walk this off. 
I could see all my injuries because my pants and my trousers were blown off. My weapon was somewhere else, uh, and I was lying there on my own. Um, it was an uncomfortable, it was an uncomfortable situation to be in, and a few emotions kind of went through my mind at the time. So I was scared. Um, I was quite angry. And one of my first emotions was guilt as well. I felt rather guilty. Because not only could I not treat someone else that was injured, um, one of the first things that I kind of said was, why me? Which instantly implied that it should have happened to somebody else. So I felt guilty straight away. Now, it, it was painful. I, you know, I, I, won't, I won't deny it was painful. Um, but there was so much going on that it kind of, you know, it all cancelled itself out, really. So I'm lying there, and uh, I wasn't the priority. So there was a brief firefight going on, and it was probably just a couple of guys sniggering behind the bush, firing some weapons, which we all started flapping around at and trying to find out who was, who was shooting at us. So I was on the bottom of the priority list, and it was an unusual place to be in, because, you know, I've been injured. I, I should be getting looked after straight away. But it doesn't happen like that. So eventually they decided that I was now a priority and they shouted out, medic, to which I replied, I am the king medic. <laughs> Insert your own expletive. Um, and somebody else might have shouted out at another expletive in, in pure, you know, why him? Uh, and then they, they, they had to find me. So it wasn't a case of just strolling up to, to find Sai. They had to get the Valen man back out again and metal detect between me and them because there could have been a, another improvised blows device or IED between, between me and them. And in fact, there was. I'd landed less than three foot away from another improvised blows device. So the first guy to me, I had to talk him through what to do. And, and he got, you know, we got the tourniquets out. I had to insist on him, I had to insist to him not to put it around my neck. Um, <laughs> So one was, was applied to my right leg, and they soon made a decision to get me out. One of the other guys that came to find me was a Royal Engineer. Now, Royal Engineers, you know, you think that they like fixing stuff, but actually they don't. They like blowing stuff up. <laughs> so in his rucksack, or in his Bergen, as we call it, he, his Bergen was full of plastic and explosive. So coupled with this other IED and his plastic explosive, you know, it could have ended very, very differently. I could just be sat here as a head. <laughs> so they eventually got me out onto a stretcher, and uh, inevitably, which happens to most soldiers in, in operations, that they, I fell out of the stretcher. So they had to swing me back up, get me back onto the stretcher, and eventually they outside of the patrol base. And that's where they really saved my life. Um, cutting edge medical procedures were carried out on me, and uh, you know that's where really. You know, I, I have to leave most of my thanks, to be honest with you. Incidentally, a, a helicopter, one of the, the Chinook with the two propellers, um, was already in the, in the air to come and collect another soldier that had been shot, an Afghan national soldier. Um, my wounds were considered worse, so the helicopter was diverted to me. Um, I remember getting in that helicopter, clearly I didn't walk, uh, and I got onto the helicopter. I was kind of looking for people I knew, because all my colleagues were were clinicians that I'd worked with out there, and I was looking for a friendly face, someone I could just speak to and, and have a bit of human contact with. So we eventually got back to Camp Bastion, which was 40 kilometers away, and I got off and into an ambulance, and then eventually I got into the emergency department. And at this point, I realized that, uh, you know, my little fight, my little battle was over, because each, each part of that journey was a stepping stone. So the first guy getting to me, me getting onto the stretcher, me being treated outside the patrol base and then loaded into the helicopter and eventually getting back to Bastion, it was a stepping stone back to my wife. Because bearing in mind, we'd only been married for less than three months at that point. And I was holding on by my fingertips to get back. And it was an overriding emotion that I couldn't not, that wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. It wasn't, there wasn't an option for me not to do it. I had to get back. And at this point, I couldn't really fight any longer. You know, I'd expended far too much energy on, on emotionally and physically on keeping myself alive, and I had to be very conscious that I was going to hand that over to somebody else. 
So I was in hospital, unconscious, and you know, to begin with, um, kept in an induced sort of uh, unconscious state. And I've sort of been pieced together different bits and pieces. And, and I know that Marissa used to, she used to kind of stroke my head and, um, and she used to watch on the machines my heart rate coming down and my blood pressure coming down. And I think it's quite nice the fact that that's the form of communication we could have. I mean, it was one way. It was obviously one way from Marissa, but at least we had some sort of form of communication. I remember when they woke me up on that first, on that Friday, and uh, one of the bane of my life was this nasogastric tube that was feeding me, and I kept on pulling it out. And the surgeons would put it back in, and I'd pull it back out again. And we had this little battle of wills, which I <coughs> ended up winning. And I remember waking up, and this arm was, you know, was held up like this, and, and I could, it was kind of, it was very blear, bleary. I could see Marissa on this side, and this nurse was coming towards me on this side, and I was garbling a message at her, trying to trying to, you know, signal to her. And the nurse was, you know, what's he saying? And Marissa said, oh, I think he's trying to high-five you. <laughs> and I just, I remember, you know, I remember hospital, and it wasn't as bad as, you know, as you think. Um, one of the things that got me through hospital is Homes Under the Hammer, which is, as you know, <laughs> a DIY home-selling sort of programme. <laughs> And that's the one thing that got me through hospital. So I used to try and get my wife to come in in the mornings and help me with my morning routine, you know, washing and shaving and cleaning my teeth. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't really need her there, but it was the only way I'd, I'd get to see her more. So I was lying in this hospital bed, and I've got tubes coming out of all sorts of different places. I've got my hand up in the air. Um, and she came in to, you know, to give me a wash. Now, the gentleman among you will know the mint sauce shower gel um, Ray Dog stuff. Well, it's not really supposed to go into your left eye. Um, but my wife managed to squirt a whole chunk of this into my left eye. Um, so I asked her not to come in again after that. <laughs> and then we were kind of given a rite of passage where we could go to local cup, uh, local pub, which was called The Country Girl, and, uh, you know, to have our first beer. Um, and I remember... I wasn't trained to use a wheelchair. My wife wasn't really trained to use a wheelchair. That you should have a qualification. <laughs> so I'm in this wheelchair, and I'm very vulnerable. I can't push down on my heels because I haven't got any. Um, and my wife decides that the best way to get up a dropped curb is to race at it at Mac 10. <laughs> and I, I, um, I was very, very worried. Um, <laughs> and. Um, Fortunately, I didn't fly out of this wheelchair, and, and, and we made it to the, to the country girl in, in one piece. Um, so I only stayed in hospital for about five weeks. If I'd known that I was, being, I was, I was getting you know, compensation for each, for each day I stayed there, I'd have stayed a lot longer. Um, but I was very conscious that I needed to move on and, and, and move on with you know, the next part of my life. So ever since then, I've had a lot of surgery. There's been about four years of surgery. But also, in, mixed in with that, there's been a lot of challenges. I'm very conscious that a lot of charities have helped me over the years, and, and I believe in giving back, and, and I, that's what I've tried to do. So I t I've taken part in a few charitable challenges. So we, we rode across America as a team of eight of us. Um, I've done some big swims where I swam around Brownsea Island, which is a small island off, off the, the English coast near Poole. Um, and all these challenges are basically me trying to get back on the horse want of a better word, but also raise money, you know, through doing a challenge. Because when I got injured, um, I realised that, you know, if you want to... Life's like a book, and you have to keep on turning the pages to find out what happens in the book. If you keep on reading the same chapter, you can't find out what happens in the end. So I was very conscious that I needed to keep on turning the pages of my book just to find out what happens. Someone said to me in hospital that um, you've got to try and find, you know, the good from the bad. So I thought, I'm going to try and find five good things from one bad thing. And for me, it was the best way to look at life. This wasn't going to change. I wasn't going to walk this off. This was my reality now, and I had to move on. And I had to find the good from the bad. I realised that before I was injured, I could do 10,000 things, but now I could do 9,000 things, and just in a different way. 
So I have got children now, and it transpires that you don't need two balls to fill a pram. <laughs> Um, and I want them to be proud of me. I want them um, to look at Daddy and think that you know he's doing a good job, and, and that uh, the life doesn't have to stop her with a with a with a disability or a you know a restriction of some sort. Um, I want to thank all those people that helped me. And I tried to put a number on that. So in the first hour, how many people helped me? I don't know. I have to consider the pilots that flew me out, the, the six men that carried my, you know, my body from the front line, the two medics that initially treated me, the 50 people that gave me their blood in Afghanistan because I bled out. You only got six units, six, um, six uh, liters in your body. Well, I was given 25 in Camp Bastion. Um, all the conditions that got me up on my feet and, 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 and allowed me to walk again all the surgeons that, over the years, put me back to, together again. A bit like Humpty, Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> so I, I try to live my life and, and bear them in mind that, you know, these are the people I've got to thank. Um, and I don't think that anything I can do will ever repay that debt. Uh, as long as my kids are proud of their dad, then I think I've done a good job. And that's my story. Thank you very much.